you you can see the bubbles of the torpedo, but you can't see the torpedo. They can blow up people. Greetings, everybody. We're coming to you live from Sochi. That's right, everyone. It's This Week in Mormons, Olympic edition. We are here to cover the Olympics of the corrupt Russian regime. These are Vladimir Putin's Olympics. We're excited to be here with all of you. I'm joined by my co-host, Al. Al, are you on the slopes right now? Yes. And what is happening? Is Torah Bright with you? She's naked, Jeff. It's a marvelous sight to see. And <laughs> the other Mormon women... That pinkest girl who's in the luge and married in 2002 or something. Naked on the slopes. It's amazing, Jeff. <laughs> Back to you, <laughs> I've buddy. Got, I've got nothing. <laughs> well, if you're new to the show and have not been alienated f- within the first minute, welcome. I will gl- do my best to alienate you now. I know you will. We're very glad to be here to bring you Mormon news and commentary and talk about what's going on in our little subculture. So if you're I'll new, I'll be welcome. eating whole wheat goldfish and drinking A and W root beer. Jeff, what will you be doing today? Can, really, do you have to really? <laughs> it's tradition. All it's right, not uh, tradition. I'm done with the goldfish. I'm done with not, the goldfish. It's not tradition. But the can of soda is already open, Jeff. I have to finish it. That's like just saying that other bad things in your life are tradition. Every man has his vice, Jeff. Uh, Mine just happened to be whole wheat goldfish crackers. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Very good. Good to hear. <laughs> and. I actually never drink soda. This was just in my fridge, and I needed some. Beverage. Yeah, since when do you ever drink soda ever? No, I almost yeah, I almost never do. This S- is like the first, except for all the butter I've beer you ages. ingested on the Sabbath. Yeah, that butter beer was off the hook, guys. That was good. Let the public record show that the man who makes fun of my love for Harry Potter spent a day in Harry Potter Land at Universal in Florida. We all worship Jesus differently, Jeff. And the, Mine happened to be worshiping Jesus with Harry Potter. The the magical, mystical world. I'm actually impressed of, with how much you picked up on that. Hearing you tell me your, th- what you did there and speak very casually about, you know, hanging out in Hogsmeade and going to the Hogshead and, going, and just naming all these places from the Harry Potter universe like it was no <laughs> big deal. I just said, oh my goodness, this is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm like... yeah. I, I'm no, like, I went to the three broomsticks for dinner, and I I ate exploding bonbons and fizzy whiz bangs, and and I bought a chocolate frog and gave it to my nephews, and it was great. You hadn't? Oh, you mean when you came back? Yeah. I said the nephews weren't there with you. Well, this is joyous news. I'm glad you had a wonderful time. Also, how was the Great Caribbean? We all missed you. No, it was it was delightful. It was my Honduran waiter was very nice. Shout out to Hank Forbes. Hank, I know that's not your real name, but thanks for serving me all that great food, buddy. I got double lobster every night. They allowed that? Are you telling me Jeff, that Royal Caribbean was better than Celebrity? Is that basically what we're Hank, doing here? Hank took phenomenal care of me. I would have lemonade sitting waiting for me before I even got to my table. Stop and I would it. just say, Hank, my good man. I, I, did you tip him generously at the end? Though? And then I would yell in the middle. Of, I'd yell, bread man cometh. And he would come over with the bread. And the sad thing is I actually know you well enough that you did this. Com- I absolutely completely. did. <laughs> yeah. Wearing a suit and tie in a room of 2,000 other people. The bread man cometh, Jeff. The bread man cometh. Did you spot any hot co-eds from Oklahoma? Was there the cruise ship pursuit? Uh, I was with a hot co-ed of my own. Were you? No, I, yeah. I went with a, uh, a girlfriend of mine and a, her family. A, a and girlfriend. It was you went with her family? I sure did, oh, Jeff. You didn't tell me it was family. You said it was just people. That's what family is. You didn't. Imp- you did not imply, nor did I infer, that it was a family affair. Obviously, isn't it? Obviously, you need to. You need to take her to Missouri. Well, it's time. That's the refiner's fire. You know, not a lot of I'm women. Actually- they say that they're okay living in Missouri because they think they're going to live in a suburb in Kansas City. 
That's true. How do you know what love is? It's willing to live in Missouri. Yeah. I love I I like I choose to live in Missouri. I love Missouri. If you, but not everybody shares that love. Yeah. It's like if you blow chunks and she stays, it was meant to be. But if you spew bro. and she bolts, bro. it's never going to happen. For sure, bro. Yeah. Bro. Well, I'm glad you're back safely. It was Yeah, I, no, it was delightful. I went to Jamaica, Haiti, and Harry Potter World. What did you do this week, Jeff? Well, let me consult my calendar. Let's look again. <laughs> okay, one second here. If we look at last week, well, <laughs> I had dinner I had dinner with some friends one night. They, What's life like as a married man? Jeff? As a married what man, you hang out with other married think? people, and that's basically what my whole did week was. Did you play headbands again, Jeff? We did not play headbands. We merely talked and laughed like adults. No games. <laughs> oh no, I forgot. On Saturday night we played Ticket to Ride. What <laughs> was that Friday before? No, it was like right before we went. Sorry, folks, no. I'm being interrupted by my wife who's coming to me. Ticket to Jugglebone. Ride was two weeks ago, Jeff. That highlight happened that, in the previous Ticket to Ride reel. is a wonderful game. The point is, we did some things. Uh, we tried to see You this. didn't know things. I, None. I went home teaching, I'll have you know. When did you last go home teaching? <laughs> I don't even have a home teachy. And whose fault my is that? Whose fault is that flightiness. for failing to be engaged in the kingdom? Oh, no, I'm engaged in there, just I don't speak Spanish, and everybody in my ward is Spanish speaking. Why? I'm in a weird immigrant ward out in Salt Lake right now. I'm in a oh, weird okay. immigrant ward, he says. Oh, yeah, I, went, I watched the Mid documentary on Saturday. Boom! <laughs> We had a party watched, for it. I hung out with people and talked and watched a light documentary. No, I, but I watched Netflix. it with passionate Democrats, so it was more amusing. How was that? The movie? Were they entertained? Or did, they, did it pull at their heartstrings? I think they were entertained in the sense that some of them have run, were actually involved in some of those campaigns back in 2008 and 2012. And so they had passionate Feeling. Nothing anti Mitt, more just like remembering when Mitt Romney slammed Obama in the first debate, and from the Obama perspective, just saying like, "Oh my gosh, that was a terrible night. It was just awful. Yeah, hated it. Yeah, uh, the Mitt documentary was was fine. It, uh, I don't think I felt a lot from it. It was just fine. It was. It, I I think an accurate description is that it was more of a home movie. It really was more of a home movie. I mean, you don't need much to establish the narrative. Did you ever watch The War Room with like James Carville and stuff? No, but I watched War Games with Matthew Broderick. The War Room was a great documentary of the Bill Clinton campaign. Yeah, I hear good things. I heard he's a good I, guy. Like I really liked that one. I thought it was really good. So it was fine. The mid one. Yeah, I mean it was. It was fine. I think the best moments were just the random ones, like when they spend an entire scene showing Mitt arguing about whether there's a food court in the certain terminal in LaGuardia Airport. That was a whole scene. Very good television right there. Also, the Papa John's reference. Had to love that one. So. Yeah. Yeah. Was, the other day I was talking to Papa John from Papa John's Pizza. Because who else would he be? It was terrific. So perhaps my week was not as exciting as yours. And I'm not going to lie to you. A rougher, fast Sunday than typical. Wait, why? What happened? I, I've, I have no problem with fast Sundays. I admit, I think like a lot of people, fasting isn't like one of my strongest areas. I believe in it, but it, it can still be hard, you know? And I don't think I've had enough crazy experiences from doing it where I'm just like, yeah, it's time to do the fast. I hate admitting these things with my wife sitting right there because she'll think I'm some kind of a, a weakling or something because she's a rock with spiritual things, and I love her for that. But... Um, so it's because we have church at three o'clock now. And so I was just tired and I'm hungry because it's three to six at church. And it's harder to put up with the primary kids because they're really unruly and tired when they have to be at church till 6 p.m. A lot of things come together. So Fast Sundays so far in 2014 have been a little bit harder than they usually are. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of focus on Sunday. I felt like I was just kind of drifting through three hours. Here's, here's the thing, Jeff, is you know there is a power in fasting, right? Like, there is a, there is a huge power in fasting. It, and we know that, like, I know that from, from more as a kid, like, fasting with my family. I had incredible experiences with that. As a missionary, fasting was like death because we had to go out in the elements and I still... Know. I mean, that was there, the, fasting on my mission is where it went from being a spiritual thing to just being really hard. Did your mission um, president let you uh, drink water when you were fasting? No, neither did mine. 
No, here's what I would do. Like because we get so hot, it would just get so hot in the summertime out there. We would fill a bathtub with cold water and go and like we'd come in at nine thirty and then just go sit in this cold water bathtub. And then I would do this thing. You'd get that cotton mouth, and I'd like. I'd like be swishing water and spitting out and just like staring at the <laughs> clock waiting for a minute. I'm like, why, God, are we doing this? I, I remember I had an experience once. I was in my second area. Uh, it was very warm, an interior kind of arid part of Spain, uh, Zaragoza, for those who care. And Zaragoza. Right? Zaragoza. And uh, anyways, it was very hot. I'd barely been transferred there. We had a fast Sunday. And we had church in the evening, too. So it's not like we had at least church to break it up, you know, and kind of be able to chill and at least not be on the streets. And so uh, that was a long morning. Going out on Sunday morning and any mission's no fun. In Spain, it was not fun at all. Nobody's around. Everybody's asleep or drunk or something. And so uh, I just I remember walking around. And we could walk, honestly, three blocks maybe and then we'd be just exhausted because we were so thirsty and worn out and tired <laughs> and so we just sit on some steps and be like all right what can we plan now okay let's go somewhere else very <laughs> I, I don't remember really any other fast sunday from my mission but that one has stuck in my mind and i've been home for longer than i care to admit danielle no oh, last week i told my i remember i recalled i realized i've been home for my mission for 10 years and you know what the wife does tell them honey yeah. they can't hear her she laughed. She just started laughing. That was her gut reaction. Laughter. Huh. Like I'm old or I don't know what she was saying. You're all, you're all of those things. Everything you've described. But this is the woman who laughed when I proposed to her. So I guess it's okay. Yeah. That's fair. Wait, she laughed when you proposed? I t she laughed when I proposed. Not like in a... Was it because of your big weird shaped nose? It was because of my beard weird shaped nose. That was exactly why. Because She was like, this guy? Here's the thing. With Danielle's a beautiful woman. She also has a very perfectly structured nose. People have asked her if, she has a no if she's had a nose job, and she hasn't. So uh, I could understand her not wanting to mix those jeans with my, my Evans razor cut thing I have going on on my schnoz. It's... You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't fault anybody <laughs> for it. It's okay. I'm just kidding. Jeff. It's okay. I'm okay with it. You don't have a weird shaped nose. I know I don't, but I'm playing along. If you really want to hit my sore spot with my physical appearance, it's all about my slightly thinning hair in place in along my crown. What? You have such good hair. I've had good hair most of my days, but nowadays we need to pray for a miracle, everyone. Sure, we could pray that Ukraine gets legitimate democracy and freedom of expression, or we can pray. That I somehow have yeah. Have you been uh, have you been following that these last couple of days? I mean, it's still like, I mean, just crazy over there. It's it's yeah. I mean, honestly, I appreciated that I saw some Facebook posts on Sunday where people said, seriously, even if you don't know what this is about, if you want to fast for Ukraine, then do that because it's a it's a mess. It's on the brink of civil war. I personally don't think it'll get to that, but it's. It's crazy. Well, right and now. and uh, John Kerry actually showed some chutzpah and went over there and said, "Quit this stuff." Yeah, which was out of out of the blue. I mean, he that guy. I was not expecting any support from. Yeah, from, finally uh, the U officials at all. Finally, the U.S. and the European Union seem to be getting into gear a little bit because they've got to dangle something. You know, they've got to say, "Hey, you want to be included in Europe? We need to give you incentives other than just having Russia write checks because you know, it makes sense. If Russia's writing checks, go to the person who's giving you money, obviously. So it's very sad. In other news, as far as praying, um, I saw an interesting thing with fasting, going back to that, actually. I, California's been in a pretty bad drought for a while. And apparently, yeah. I, I guess this was totally statewide. Um, I'm not sure being from the South and my... My in-laws are from the South, too, so I don't know. But uh, I believe statewide, they actually asked the members to pray for rain because it's been so bad there. And you know what happened yesterday? It, it rained. Just dumped, it, it rained. dumped buckets all over the Southland, which is awesome. And seeing, not all over, sorry, San Diego's not part of the Southland. It's its own entity. But um, it rained everywhere. And I love seeing more Facebook posts from people in the area kind of like praising the miracle of it. Honestly, I mean, this, this was like a se seagulls and cicadas in St. George kind of thing. With Lorenzo Snow. You know what I'm saying? Cicadas? I say cicada. That's not the, how it's pronounced. Probably not, because I think of John Cicada, the musician. <laughs> and so I've always said it that way. <laughs> but that is cool. But good for them. That's they great. got rain. You know, miracles are a great thing, and I think all too often we don't think they're real. And there's no reason to assume that that wasn't God answering prayers. I agree with that. 
Yeah, it was awesome. Did you see Philip Seymour Hoffman died? Yes, I I did see that go through the news. It was sad, not related to us, other than the fact that we don't believe in doing drugs. So, yeah, well, it's a bummer. I mean, so here's sad. how it can relate to us. The, Please, the, Al, take it there. Correlate this. The story. fact the fact that our reaction is well, is, yeah. I mean, it's more like oh, it was a junkie. We shouldn't think that. I don't react that he was a junkie. I think it's a sad tale of addiction, and addiction takes many forms and across many mediums. And this was a man who was who openly struggled with with forms of addiction. I mean, he was sober for a very long time, and he admitted last year he relapsed into some drug use and went to to rehab. And clearly, he was struggling. Addiction's a very potent thing. I mean, it's remarkable. You can talk to people who are alcoholics, and they'll say like, "I haven't had a drink for twenty years, but I'm an alcoholic," because they know. That if they if they dip into that just a little bit, it's not like they're just going to have one little cocktail. You just do you feel like he chose drugs end. over friends and fans? I have nothing to say about that. How, who knows? But addiction's a sad, real thing. I mean, the the thing that we fail to understand is oftentimes it's a a chemical, psychological compulsion to do things, whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography or whatever it may be. You know, it's a it's a struggle for a lot of people, and it shouldn't be trivialized. No, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I I agree. I've I've seen a lot of posts. Of, well, there's there's been a, um, I mean, well, anytime a celebrity, I guess, uh, dies or uh, or has drug trouble that is in the in the public eye, I think a lot of times the reaction is, especially from like the Mormon crowd, is they're a bad example. You know, we like I thought they were good. Now they're bad. Darn it, those, those jerks. And, and uh, you know, in, in situations like this, I think it is a great opportunity for us to just kind of think about how, how crummy that would be to go in a way where you were, you know, guilt-ridden, I'm sure, alone in your bathroom and just like, I mean, like, with, well, today we, we even have a story on here uh, about, let's see, oh, masturbation is on here, right? The war on masturbation, Kim B. Clark has some talk that's intercut with a really weird movie. Uh, the, and it's not necessarily about masturbation, but everybody it's thinks not. it is. Yeah, the media is being stupid about this one. Yeah. And uh, it's actually it's a weird movie on, the, on battling pornography and how I guess your roommates in college should know that you're, doing, you're looking at pornography and help you. Uh, and so like... like but we're, so we're going to... We'll chat about that and we can actually chat about it right Let's now. Let's chat about even. it right but, uh, now. But... I mean, it's this idea that uh, that I like. I feel like addiction addiction should just be given a little bit more clout than we are prone to give it because it's a lot harder than a lot of people give it credit for. Um, and the people that are struggling with it, I mean, it, it, if if you ever talk to a smoker who's smoking, they they'll talk to you and they'll say, "Man, I wish I would have never ever picked it up." Right? And everybody does. If you're struggling with anything, you just say, "Man, I wish." I wish it just. I wish that this wasn't a problem. I wish that I wasn't uh, prone to to want it. I wish that I didn't, you know, like like struggle and and feel the guilt that I do. I wish that it like I just wish that I didn't have this in my life. And uh, whether it's whether it's pornography or masturbation or uh, heroin, as Philip Seymour Hoffman dealt with, uh, I like all of these are very real things, and so. I, I like just yeah I mean when you when you see somebody or you know somebody that's struggling with that I mean maybe maybe just a, a, a hug and like not trying to uh to to talk them through it if you've never been through it yourself and just say you know I'm really sorry this is hard for you right can we agree on that Jeff? I can oh completely completely well, let's let, no, let's go off. Let, let's talk about this uh, this video that came out of BYU Idaho. Oh yeah, the no, video I, was I, just weird. I can set it up. Did you watch the whole thing? Oh, you said you stopped I, once. Well, the... I watched it. I watched it, and then it got into this weird World War II throwback thing, and I was like, "All right, this is turning into like a really long version of the Armor of God," and I'm not sticking around. For there it. we go. So for the uninitiated, and and the funny thing is, so this has been going all around it, the internet, and they're talking about a Mormon. War on masturbation. The funny thing is, the video makes no reference to that. The video. I haven't seen this going around anywhere. Who is? Where is this going around? I, it's going around enough that if you if you search for war on masturbation, you will see most major clickbait type outlets have something about it. And it's frustrating because 
for one thing, it gives people the wrong idea. I'm not saying we do not uh, have an issue with taking care of business for on oneself. That's still something we talk about. But this video itself is not an anti-masturbation video. It's an anti-pornography addiction and a call for help. And I, I still think the video is weird. I don't think it's the best done way to get that point across or anything like that. But uh, especially, I mean, it starts off, you know, it shows this guy on his computer. For one, Al, not th I'm not saying you have experience with this or anybody else. Does. <laughs> but if you go, are, are go at on. BYU ashamedly watching pornography, why would you be doing so with your bedroom door wide open? And your screen free for all to see. It's a cry for help, Jeff. I want somebody to catch me, so I'll stop. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the cry for help. Because the first that's the first thing I thought when I watched it. I was like, wait a minute. His roommate just walks in and then just kind of says, oh, that's that's what's going I, on. I like that your first thought is strategies for how to not get caught <laughs> while you're watching porn. You're like, man, rookie mistake. No, I thought about First thing you do is you put, a, you put a row of soda cans out there so you hear them trip over it if they come close. I just thought it... It seemed ridiculous, and then of course his his roommate, um, and understandably no, if, so. If I never your roommate. If your roommate installs a deadbolt, <laughs> we can do the Jeff Foxworthy bit. If your roommate installs a deadbolt on his dorm room door, he's probably watching pornography. Yeah, I've, I've. If uh, your roommate has a laptop in bed with him at night, every night till four in the morning, he's not typing emails. He's probably watching pornography. Al, don't you sometimes stay up late with your laptop? If I well, I do, but I'm working and I'm in the living room. Uh huh. If but you live alone, room, Al. You live alone. I do. There's there's no one to keep track of you and help you out. You're gonna have to trust me. I have no roommate to save me. McKay Coppins told me something about you, Al. McKay Coppins and I frequent the same circles, Jeff. There we go. So the the uh, yeah. So uh, well, like Kim B. Clark, he's just like roommates help them. There's not a. It's not. A, it's not. No roommates ever talk about this stuff. You just don't. Well, I think unless unless you blatantly walk in on somebody, you're like, "Ha, huh, naked women." Uh, okay, buddy, let's have a chat. Like, there's a great segue into it. But you can't. I mean, you can't just be like, "Um, hey, bro." I know. I well, think, I think I think that's. The I thing. think you're struggling with this. And what it's trying to set up is that yes, yeah, society has stigmatized things, and and Satan wants us to feel ashamed, and so we don't necessarily help each other out. I agree. I mean, like, I've never walked in on a roommate. Looking at stuff, and admittedly, if they were, I don't think I would just be like, dude, dude, what are you doing? I I would potentially just be a little concerned to maybe walk away and try to find a way to address the topic at another point. I don't know, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there is something to be said for the value of, uh, of relying on others, of having a sense of camaraderie. And that's the point, at least, that Kim B. Clark is trying to make, that you, know, you wouldn't leave – a soldier wounded in the battlefield. So then, no. so then, if you know your friend or no roommate is struggling, behind, Jeff, you know I say that. What? Yeah, they said, why would you leave them? But the only other downside is they seem to kind of hint that instead you need to like tattle, go tell the proper authorities that this is going on. I don't think that's appropriate at all. Ever. What? Wait, you don't think it's appropriate to go tell your bishop that your roommate's in some sketchy stuff? I don't think so, because I think it's on it's on, it's on the individual to come to that. It's a part of repentance is not having other people tell on you unless you have adversely affected their lives. That's okay, you know, if if you were if there was abuse or something involved. But uh, I think the better step would be to try to have a discussion and be frank about it and encourage someone to seek help. But you don't go tattle on somebody. How is that going to build trust or understanding? You're just gonna, true. You're just going to feel like people were you know snarking, being a narc. We did. Uh Wait, did he say that 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 like the right thing to do? Oh, uh, I, for, I forgot about the exact line, but it was basically said as much. Did he ask them all to join Kim Clark Youth? I don't know. And all band together for the higher powers. I don't know. So I don't know. The point is, uh, you know, this of course is telling you to stay away from porn. One could argue, going back to the the M word, that. Uh, that's probably a likely byproduct of the pornography Wait, viewing. Do you not say the word masturbation? I've said it many times, but I'm attempting for the sake of our censors to... Um, Who censors us? It's our own show. Al, I don't want iTunes to label this with an explicit tag this week. I don't think masturbation is an explicit term. Neither do I. I'm just being difficult because I can be. Okay. Don't worry about it. Anyway, it makes the point, and of course they don't ever hint that women might have a problem, which is kind of sad insulting in a way i mean come on so people be there for your people but then don't be confused by the interwebs and don't tattle just we could do with maybe more openness and uh 
a sense of fraternity and helping one another out if, the, what, if there are what, struggles so, to address. I'm a firm believer in that. I don't say you want to so, like talk. So oh, with with the analogy of a wounded soldier on the battlefield, is uh, hold on. Let me play the devil's advocate for for Brother Clark here. Okay. Is there is there any responsibility? Like, should we? Take an active interest in the worthiness of a roommate or friend. Yes or no, Jeff? I think we can take an active interest, but that doesn't mean it's our place if to police. that's the case, should we, therefore, uh, bring these topics up with roommates in a, in a healthy, proactive fashion and just say, Hey, man. I don't know if you struggle with this, but I have a friend. You know, make up a story like, but I have a friend that struggles with pornography, and I always told him, go see the... Should we say things of that nature, Jeff? Well, I feel like that's pretty much what I said before. Help people out and direct them and to so get And so if help. that's the case, Jeff... Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Then should we or should we not tell the bishop that we had this conversation with this person? Maybe, I'm saying maybe only if you... M- maybe... Only if you do have that conversation. But what I'm saying is don't just say you walk in and see your roommate doing something and then just go and tell your bishop. What if you see your roommate flushed? Should you immediately assume he's been looking at porn and not playing racquetball? Yes. I agree. Especially if you're at BYU-Idaho. Because you can't play racquetball there. There are no sports. No sports, no shorts. That's the <laughs> That's rule. What just go out to the dunes and you know, don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, so so I like I think there's some merit to the uh, to the like being uh, one one in in like being not weird about it and being able to have a discussion about it and say, hey man, you know if, if you're struggling with this, like here's some ideas, you know, like hey buddy, let's go let's go running right now and and try and sweat it out. What do you say? Let's get out of here and, and get out of the house. I mean, stuff like that would be very helpful. Uh, to somebody the the I agree with you though that it's I mean it probably is not our probably not it's definitely not our place to go and have conversations about others with our uh, no. with our spiritual leaders unless they ask us if they have a concern about somebody sure. I mean sure. you can have a frank discussion about them but like I I don't think it's your place to go trying to volunteer information and a bishop if I were a bishop and somebody came in and said hey I, I don't know for sure. But my roommate's been playing an awful lot of wink, wink, racquetball. You know what I'm saying, Bishop? I'd be like, all right, get out of here, man. I don't have time for this. Yeah. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. But but there is a lot to be said in trying to help one another. I mean, that's the big thing. Because if you're accountable There's to somebody. There's a little bit to be said. There's not a lot to be said. We've said the little bit. We're done. We're done. We're done. But what I'm saying is we we live in a culture and because and Satan wants you to feel ashamed and crawl into a corner and never seek help. And don't do that. Find help. Find someone you can confide in because whenever – I think that like one of the things people fail to understand, there's a lot of people who critique the concept of confessing sins as part of repentance to a bishop. I've read this. Many people think it's out of bounds and a bishop has no business knowing stuff, whatever. But I think one of the main purposes behind that is that you have someone to whom you are accountable, someone you can work with and have goals. Because when you try to do things by yourself – you know, if you disappoint yourself, you're only disappointing yourself. I don't mean it's just for the sake of disappointment, but you know what I mean? A support system can be very useful if you're struggling with something. Yeah, so, well, so well, particularly when we talked about we talked about this as a, as a missionary, you know, like one of the biggest strengths you have is a companion that actually knows what you're going through. And yeah. You can turn to him and say, man, I'm like, my thoughts are all over the place today. I'm struggling with it. And it's somebody that is sort of holding you accountable. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fine – that is a fine idea. There we go. To be good enough friends with somebody that you can have frank conversations about it and try and be better. Okay. Good idea. Al, moving on. Let me ask you something. How, go on. How, how is your Sabbath day? Tremendous, Jeff. You- it's tremendous because I'm, I'm in an uncommitted ward relationship. I go to church. I go for my three hours. I come home. And that's what makes. And it then fun. I go to a different state and go to another church the next week, uh-huh. and then a different state uh-huh. and another. So, it's brilliant, Jeff. But, it is the best church life ever. But is it though? Let me ask you this: Do you honestly feel like how are, like that the, your Sabbath is balanced? Do you feel like you? And this is too personal. Whatever, it's fine. I'm just saying. But if you uh, do, you feel that you're getting out of Sabbath what you should be getting out of the Sabbath, or do you feel like your Sabbath is out of balance in one way or another? Uh, no, I feel like I feel like I'm getting great value out of my Sabbath. I go and have I have a, a Sunday night dinner with some very good friends of mine, the Toolers, and then I 
I will go and uh, I get I get some scripture reading in. I'll try and watch some sort of romantic comedy or something of that nature with Sandra Bullock. She's America's sweetheart. Not anymore. She's there 50. towards the evening. And uh, and that's my Sunday. That's what I do. Okay, I I think it works out great. I get and, a little scripture reading in the middle there, you know. And that's good. The scripture reading. I ask you this, namely because uh, there's an article here by Common Consent. That, Jeff, how is your Sunday? Well, do you have balance? Well, it's okay. This article is called "Dear Church, We Need Our Sabbath Day Back," alleging that the Sabbath has become another day of work and sometimes even more work. And there there is you know there are old Mormon adages you know. Ironically, my busiest day of the week is Sunday, which is true in many cases, and that's part of serving. And so before I get into mine, there's a good point to be made, though. I, I think we saw that during the Savior's ministry in the New Testament, when people, you know, when the, the Pharisees condemned him for healing on the Sabbath, for example, that was, yeah. that was a good example to us of the fact that b- working to build the kingdom and to serve others is not the same type of work as as one might engage in Absolutely. on other days. So that can be part of the Sabbath. But I do understand that sometimes the Sabbath can be an exhausting day. And perhaps for some, not for the right reasons. Like mine's fine. I feel like I have decent... Wait, you, are, are you suggesting that maybe we're perturbed that we're wearing ourselves out in the service of the Lord? I think uh, it's, it's a fair point to make. And that's something this article here mostly... Should we all shed a tear for the fact that we're trying... To the, we're taking one day and giving a tiny bit of effort towards building the kingdom. Should we, we should we all feel awful about how much work we have to do for that? See, and these are the fair points to make that I think the article misses. This article seems a little uh, oh, more... Uh, it does make the point that, of course, the true notion of the Sabbath is, is that six days we work and on the seventh day we rest. And, they, and it does say, you know, not rest in the sense that I don't do anything and I'm lethargic and whatever, but in the sense of a day to actually... Sure, go enjoy some church meetings and then have a day to contemplate and write in a journal and have peace. But all too often, it seems, serving in the church, especially in some of the busier callings, winds up just sucking up your all entire right, All right, time. before we get too caught up in the six days we work, the seventh we rest, Jeff, when you start working your sixth day, then you can come and feel entitled to napping on the seventh. You have nothing on a Saturday. So nothing. Use that is your nap. nap nothing time, on a Saturday. I watched the Mitt Romney documentary. It was taxing. You do nothing on a Saturday, and then Sunday comes around. And you're like, oh no, I need more nap time. No, shut your face. I went to a Sunday p- is for Jesus work. I went to a priesthood Get back breakfast to work. on Saturday. No, no, yeah. So so oh no, oh no. I feel awful that you actually have to make a little effort or something on. A Sunday. Well, guess what? You're not working seven days. You millennial generation, you bunch of entitled cowards. What do you want, a trophy? Get out of here, man. How do you feel about, uh, and this article also then, <laughs> I'm enjoying your opinions on this, Al. Um, <laughs> well, the other notion, some people in this article, like he says, he says, hey, I, uh, you know, what I want to do sometimes is just skip church some Sundays because then it gives me a respite and it actually lets me have a day of rest and contemplation of peace. And thinking. Oh, oh yeah. And pensivity. No. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, Wiener. <laughs> so, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? On, like, this is what gets me, right? Is you have, if you need rest and pensivity and all that other gibberish, Saturday's there. In fact, Sunday, I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, you're gonna get a, an hour or two on a Sunday. Like, you have an hour, and unless you have little kids, church, church. I mean, go there and get your worship. Okay, right? so go sit, go sit in sacrament meeting and have so Al your your advice worship. your advice then only applies to people with either well people, young so people young married kids, single people or I, no, empty no, no. nesters. No, no, basically. no. So this this is the caveat: people with kids go to church, and the, and there's very little spiritual nourishment that happens. That's when why you have I'm kids. exhausted. It's like I'm a babysitter you every go Sunday. To, you go to church. You go to church to set the example for your kids. I, and I mean, you're either out in the foyer or you're. I mean, you're you're not listening to the speaker. You're worried about this kid that's throwing graham crackers at the lady in front of you. I mean, you got a lot going on. And so I feel bad for for those people. And if anybody needs. You know that break or that that moment on a Sunday. It's it's parents of little children and primary teachers. So go. I mean, I mean, let, if you don't have little kids, go grab a parent's 
kid or something for an hour and just let them enjoy a relief society or a priesthood session or meeting. So they have an actual, like they, they're people that I feel bad about, but this guy's probably just some, some schmo, some like middle-aged man who's, who's tired because he, he wants to watch the Super Bowl and he's sad that he wasn't home for it. Okay. And, and that's probably the case. And he, you just want, what you want is you want a seventh day of doing nothing for yourself instead of actually having to go have responsibility and do something productive. Here's a, here's a fair one to say, though. It's a couple of these. I'm with you on most of this stuff, Al. I think that, though I agree it can be exhausting. Like, teaching primary is fine and everything, and I enjoy it, and it's and we have a lot of fun with the kids, but I'm, I mean, I'm beat, like I said before. It's, well, it's well church isn't supposed to be sitting in a lazy boy and just getting spoon-fed Would you doctrine. let me it's finish a thought? The gospel. Sir, I am speaking. You're speaking froth. The point, the point is, I understand why I'm not a parent, but I understand how it gets tiring, and I understand how you feel like you get less out of church because of it. I do. And so yeah. and in some ways it, eats into, it can eat into things. They do make a point I like at the end that says Sunday evenings, at least, should be held as sacrosanct as Mondays. And it's true. We make such a big deal about family home evening. We could make a big deal about making sure Sunday evenings are also peaceful and at least you have stuff ironed out. I think one of the hard things, though, it's not just serving people in church, but we do waste a lot of time with just meetings on Sundays. And I don't necessarily think that the meetings themselves are required to be on the Sabbath, to be effective. Um, the article has one idea. Like, why not take some of those things like PEC, Bishopric Ward Council, and just do them during the three-hour block? You know, Rather than doing it before church or after church, just like none of those people are going to miss actually going to Relief Society or something else or whatever. Yeah, if I may suggest, do it during priesthood and Relief Society, not during Sunday and school. That's the, Sunday school can actually yeah, be good. Yeah, so, and that's not the worst idea. I mean, that's one way to, to take in some of the time. I mean, the poor bishop's going to be there all day no matter what. So does it really – we can just do what we want around his schedule, right? It's perfect. So I don't know. I, I, I think the Sabbath can be hard for some people, but for the most part, I think mine's been pretty – Mine's been pretty fine most of my life. There are times when it's tiring, but you also feel yeah, so, you feel so good. Sunday you feel good I'll, when you're serving in the kingdom. You feel great. Sunday night, I'll give you right. Like when you come home from church and you have a two hour quick burst, and then you got to go to a fireside or something like that. I mean that, like that does add some stress to your well, Sunday. Well, that's that's how I feel now. We get out of church at six, and so I, I mean, we have to go home and. I mean, we can't even just casually like make a nice dinner where we take our time doing it. We prepare everything in advance. And it's like this world of slow cookers and stuff we can get ready earlier on in the day. I, I do like <laughs> I like a fire like a quarterly fireside or something yeah. like a, something to look forward to. But most nights, I mean, if you could leave that alone, that'd be great. Yeah. So I'll give because like that. if there was a fireside I wanted to go to, I don't know if we'd go because we'd want to go home and have dinner. And then if a fireside's at seven, that gives us you know like an hour to do everything. I, oh my gosh, you're so old. You're just old married people. We're not old. I'm just saying that getting out of church at Jeff, six is the dumbest thing the church has ever done. Oh my gosh! All right, it's the worst we, thing we ever. On. All they I'm have to do, rather than spending money say. fighting alcohol legislation in Utah, they can give me a bigger parking lot so I can go to church at one. Huh. I hate you. It's all okay, I need. Okay, so there's some Mormons in Sochi. Did you know that we got Sochi Winter Olympics happening this week? Okay, hit me. The communist Russia. They're not communists per se. No, they're fa they're, they're fascists they're, now. It's more fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We got a couple of people in there. Noel. Pickest pace. She's married, even though she wears skin tight. <laughs> Loose suits. Because those two are mutually exclusive. <laughs> married. Yeah, people you should can. wear. You should only wear baggy clothes once you're married. What are you doing? Sorry. Then we got David Bissett. He's also a Mormon fellow, a Canadian bobsledder. Uh, very exciting. Jessica Jensen from Idaho. Uh huh. Will be there. Good for her. What about one Australian? Torah Bright. Torah, Torah, Torah. Four years ago this week, Jeff, we talked about Torah, Torah, Torah. We loved her. Now she's married. We cannot love her. Well, let's do uh, it. Let's see. Man. Eric Fisher also was there. Chris Fog Fogget. <laughs> Fogget. F O G H F O G T Fogget. Fog Fogget. Uh -huh. I don't know. I'm sure grade school was not kind to him. Um Let's see. Kate Hansen Hold on. is a Mormon Tora woman. Bright single, Al. She'll be in the Luge. I'm letting you know that. She went to BYU. Did you know that? Tora Bright Exciting. got divorced. I'm talking about... And then Jessica Jensen will be doing Slope Style. This is terrific news. Eric Nielsen, High Speed Sled. Good for these guys. Christian Nickham. And Christian Nickham's a loser. 
and Steve Nyman. Are we just going to keep naming all these people? We can scared. do this all day. That's all of them. I got them. Okay. Well, good luck in Sochi, everybody. Don't uh, yeah, don't get don't get arrested or start a protest or say nice things about homosexuals. Pretend to be gay and just see how Russia handles. Have a it. fabulous Olympics. Yep. Thanks. All right. Moving on. An article that is called. I swear when I saw it, it was called 10 Things You Didn't Know Mormons Invented, but then the article is actually seven. We couldn't get to the other three. Maybe they, maybe they lost three things. <laughs> I guess so. Let's go through seven things that Mormons invented. Everyone knows number one, sure. of course, is tele- wow, television. You know, Philo- I knew a Mormon invented that. Philo this Farnsworth. This already full of garbage. He did it up there in uh, whatever that is, Rigby, Idaho. You'll see a sign when you go through there. Good, Philo Farnsworth. Good job, Philo. Number two. The electric guitar. We might have invented that. We might have invented it, but let's be honest. Fender and Gibson actually made it, so it was like good. Okay. The traffic light. Did not know that. And really, the apparently first, the, that was the original traffic light was a was a man standing at the at the bottom of an intersection, turning a light red or green. And it was in Salt Lake. Go figure. Really, the first ever traffic lights, huh? And Salt Lake er, citizens originally did not like it. They looked upon it as a silly novelty. Uh-huh. Next up, artificial heart transplant surgery. Knew that. How can you sit through a lifetime of Elder Neil or Elder Nelson's talks and never hear him reference? But he didn't do it. It was, it was Doctor William. No, he didn't. But he talks Dibbers. about he, he talks about how it was a Mormon that did. Uh, also, the digital sound that we associate with CDs and DVDs. Dolby surround. I don't think it's Dolby, but it's Soundstream Inc. I don't necessarily believe this. Well, you better believe. He thinks a, he thinks a Swedish guy named Robert Ingebrigtsen. Yes. And his mentor, Professor Thomas Stockholm. Uh huh. Wrote the software that read what a CD is. They did it. I don't. I think that's silly. I, l- I don't. Nope. Think they've done it. They made the first Maybe digital movie. Right. The hearing aid was also invented by a Mormon. A Provo, Utah Mormon. And last but not him. least, everybody, apparently, the odometer. Yeah, the guy who has ruined the, who is it, on Ferris Bueller's Day Off, who's the, the friend, Car- Cameron? Yeah, Cameron. 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 Yeah. I don't remember his last he name. They ruined his life. No one knows his last name, but, but Cameron, yeah. When Cameron was in Egypt land. <laughs> Let my Cameron go. So there we go, folks. Things that Mormons you've, invented, which makes it, you've done it more important than it would have been otherwise. So the church released another essay this week. Did you know this? Tell show? me, tell me, of tell course me. course you did. Tell me. It's the uh, Book of Mormon and DNA Studies. Oh, my goodness. So there's a lot of people that say, oh, because DNA uh, stuff, that's what, I mean, the, obviously, obviously, you know, the the American Indians were not descendants of people from the Middle East. They were descendants of Asians. Um, so this clearly cannot be a true book. They say that. Okay, so so tell us what's true. They say those things. So I really, again, I really like that the church is is trying to address some of these and just saying, all right, well, so here's what's being said. Here's how we understand it. Essentially, the essay just talks about how um, the DNA the DNA research is. Like it's not conclusive in saying that that uh, because it's not there, like because you don't see a certain DNA strand prominent in a Middle East people, doesn't necessarily mean that that conclusively it's not it, like it was never a part of any of it. The part that that I've always understood uh, to be the case, and this is why I've always, I mean, this is where I go uh, in these conversations is. Is we don't believe that the entire continent of America was covered with Indians that were from uh, Nephi and Lehi, right? I mean, even in the Book of Jacob, right. it references like so the so they come over. You got Nephi and and Lehi and Laman and Lemuel, and they all land and they set up shop. And by the end of or by the beginning of Jacob, so right after Nephi's died, they're one generation in. There's the the Antichrist comes, having learned their language, he comes into their land and teaches it, right? He's not from their tribe. He comes and learns their language and teaches them. Like, so one generation in, we already have, there's people from, from outside their little group coming in and talking to him. So you have this this little group, and uh, and that's 
I mean, that's their jam. So we don't know. I mean, we have no no insight into how this scales up um, from like you know their population wise. Perhaps Lane and Lemuel just were uh, you know that was a name they had for like the other native Indians. Uh, and maybe Lemon and Lemon just went and hung out with them and, and banded together, and that's just how they identified them. I mean, they're, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, of room for like like for all we know, honestly, yeah. if we got to the end and we we're like, hey, guess what? The the Mormons just lived in Kentucky and all the way up into uh, Wisconsin. And that was that was their little band. That's all they did. And you're like, what? Because we thought that they were running the Panama Canal. That's what we had in our head. Um, but I mean, maybe that's well, not the case. Well, you know, I'm becoming a bigger believer in the Great Lakes theory. You are. I've I'm more persuaded by it than I used to be. Yeah. Instead of things it's, being in, down in the only part of it that seems a little bit off would be that Nephi clearly departed from what was probably present day Oman. Okay, on the Arabian Peninsula in the Indian Ocean, and it would make sense to just go across all the ocean and then land on the western coast of somewhere in the Americas. Whereas if they were to land in the Great Lakes region, that would assume they went all the way around, you know, the Straits of Magellan and all the way around the Americas through the Atlantic up into the St. Lawrence River somewhere until they, which they could have very well done, but it does seem like a much more. Out, well, that, that, they suggested out rather that it, they landed somewhere in like Mississippi. Yeah, but either way, that involves going all the way around. So, America, well, so, which could have so, happened. I mean, the, but, the, DNA, the DNA side of it, I'm just like, we don't need, I mean... Go go sample the Sioux and the and the uh, Sequoia and all these Sequoias. Sequoia was a man, not an Indian uh-huh, tribe. Uh-huh. Uh, so well, I mean, like, go you can go sample their DNA and and find it missing. We're not saying like they they're not suggesting that the Nephites were the ancestors of all of these people. No. And so the the article just kind of it talks about that. It talks about understanding genetic evidence. It talks about. Um, I mean, essentially, just suggests that it's not uh, necessarily conclusive. The founder effect uh, and population bottleneck and genetic drift. Population so bottleneck kind it of just, cool idea. It just gives you like a little bit to say. All right, well, let's let's try and understand what we're saying with this, and not just use a very broad DNA says because most people don't have any idea what they're saying when they say that. And so it's more uh, an effort to understand. Yeah. And so if that's something that you're interested in or that you've been curious about, I mean, it's worth a read. Definitely worth a read. Um, some of those explanations like you just referenced, the founder effect, population bottleneck, genetic drift, they're theories, but they are interesting and they give you something to think about. I mean, bottleneck alone is fascinating. Basically, the catastrophic event wipes out a certain gene line or most of it. And then that smaller pool that's left does diversify, but no matter what, the original other diversity is just lost. You know, you can't ever get that back. There's, but like Al said, there are, all, there are many things that could have gone wrong and could have happened. And they're yeah. not, and we aren't the only ones. Um, the, the church has not given up on its truthfulness because a DNA researcher did not find. Exactly. Uh, let's do a couple missionary stories now, starting with. Uh, we've talked about this a few weeks ago, things that if missionaries should perhaps spend more time doing actual service and other things that aren't just out there on the streets tracting, et cetera, et cetera. So now, uh, at least in the San Jose mission in California, they're actually doing just that. Uh, it appears that for a number of hours in the day, every morning, it seems, they uh, missionaries are putting on their, their T-shirts and their jeans and stuff, and they are getting out there and doing actual service that has nothing to do with baptizing no tracting they're just getting out there and helping their communities they're i think t- that's they're, great they're testing this out it's kind of cool i i think that that is uh that is how they should be doing it i think that hoeing an old lady's garden uh is going to be a much more impactful way of spending your morning than walking around and tracting so good for them. Yeah. So San Jose uh, was the pi- was the pilot, and now it's moving on elsewhere. I hope it does. I hope it sticks. I hope they like it. Uh, Imagine Dragons oh. was interviewed recently, okay. and uh, yeah, the their lead guy was it Reynolds yeah. served a mission in Omaha, and he talks about how how great it was going as a as a kid. You go into these situations where you have like a wife there with an abusive husband and no job and all this stuff. And he's, you're just sitting there in your white shirt trying to figure out how to help them get off the drugs and make a little cash to pay their rent. 
He's like, when you do that, you grow up fast, and uh, then you come home, and you're less concerned with being cool. You're less concerned with uh, with all of that silly stuff, and you want to go and actually make an impact. Which I actually remember distinctly as I came home from my mission, having a similar like, like, all right, I can't just sit around and be a dork anymore. I need to actually go and do meaningful things because I am a better person than I was. Are so, you though? Missions make you better. They do. And uh, related to this, of course, you know that, you know, as of last year, missionaries are getting more involved with Facebook and stuff and social media. The church is embracing more technology. There's a great article. It's very long, but I encourage you give it a read. It's in the Atlantic. Of course it's long. It's in the Atlantic, so of course it's long. The article is called The Facebook of Mormon. Get it? See what he did there? Facebook of Mormon. Oh, oh. Uh, anyways, it's interesting, though, but you, we get a little bit more backstory about some of the church's pilot programs, just as, ne- you know, just as they're doing pilot programs right now for service stuff. Even as far back as 2010, the church was doing pilot programs and having missionaries use social media, in this case, iPod Touches, uh, to have trans, you know, dictionaries and media and a lot of other things available to them. And so we go into a lot of this history of uh, these missionaries who were involved in these, these pilot programs. And, of course, they were blown away because they're like, wait a minute. Like they tell the story of the Philadelphia mission president calling in four missionaries and saying, look, I want you to pilot this social media stuff and see how it goes. And they're like, seriously, you want us to like play on the Internet? What? Um, but it's fascinating to read. And you, and you see some who conducted uh, some experiments, actually taking four zones and giving half two of those zones. Uh, the in this case iPod touches access to stuff and not giving any to the other two and they saw baptisms double in the ones that have more access to technology and so uh, I won't spo- I won't spoil the whole thing but it's definitely a good read and it's I'm glad that the church cooperated too in allowing interviews with current missionaries ones who just barely came home ones who were mission presidents or missionaries years and years ago for example there are many many good citations in here all about sort of this this history and how current mission presidents can say. I like how one says, I can't imagine doing work here now without this iPod capability, which is spoken just like an old man mission president who never owned a smartphone until the church <laughs> made him use one. But that's okay. <laughs> and the crazy things that the kids are doing The nowadays. kids and the Facebooks. But uh, yeah, you hear the stuff. I mean, how this one missionary wanted to track down some investigator and she was never home. So instead they found her on Facebook and chatted on there. And that's what made headway. Or these sisters in Russia who were able to maintain a relationship over Skype, and the woman eventually got baptized. And that's a great way, I think, especially to stay up with uh, investigators who might not be physically convenient as far as, you know, if you have these wide, broad areas, because realistically, you only, if you don't have a car, you know, you stay in kind of a core. But a great way to stay in touch with people who might be farther out there who are generally interested and to keep them well, involved. and I mean, a lot of times when you're serving in an area, you make a real connection with with a family, and yeah. maybe they have questions they're more comfortable asking you, and not the not the new missionary. And so the new missionary can like continue working with them and and work on that. But there's no reason to forego that relationship and lose that connection uh, just because you're you're out of the area. Yeah, and what and what I love here at the end is she this writer mentions that when she started interviewing missionaries, she pretty much assumed that uh, like tech, access to technology and social media would just kind of erode their productivity because it would expose them to, you know, temptation and also, of course, uh, to doubt. Because by being on Facebook, these missionaries are going to find, you know, more difficult Mormon topics are going to come across them, things they wouldn't find otherwise if it was the old days when you're just kind of in a bubble. Um, right. But she said she's surprised to see how similar their stories of struggle are with uh, with those who served in the 60s and in the 70s. That it's really just the mediums have changed, but sort of the feelings of inadequacy and the temptations and all of those things are really the same at all times. And just so technology can just help out. Anyways, it's a good article. I hope you'll all give it a read. It's definitely worth your time. Uh, a couple of things you need to know. There's Mormons back on The Amazing Race, the father-son duo. Huzzah! Keep an eye out for them. What's their name, Al? Uh, I don't care. You should care. Jeff, they'll be the only guys in knee-length shorts. This guy blew it out... Is- Dave and Connor. Dave and Connor were great the first time around. Dave blew out his Achilles tendon and kept running the race and and was coming in first on legs with his son. But then he finally threw in the towel voluntarily because if he didn't go get it fixed, he was going to suffer like you know permanent damage and not be able to walk and stuff like that. I like it. So they get to return for an all-star edition of The Amazing Race. I wrote an article about them last year when they were on it. It was wonderful. Twim was on Ask Angela. No one read it because <laughs> apparently no one reads Ask Angela. 
In fact, Ask Angela has feigned that she listens to this podcast. I bet you she does not. Oh, this is. She didn't hear this thing. If you hear this, Angela, yeah. send us a note, please. And actually, if we do not hear from you, then we will know you do not listen. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. You're going to do the Deseret. Jeff has a, Jeff has an article called "I Will Be Single Forever." You will, Al. It's true. He is suggesting that uh, because people don't know when they're on dates. They say they say like sixty percent of people are sure that it's just hanging out when they're actually the other party is thinks they're on a date. I see Weird. you being a hanger outer, Jeff. I date like a mofo. I'm a I'm a very active date. But you straight up say like I I am. You walk up and you say hi. I'm interested in you. I want to take you on a date. No, I say Boom, shakalaka. No, never mind. I can't say. Well, what? No, no what do you I, say? I'll please share up, with the class. I will go up. To, <laughs> I was going to reference a, a filthy rap song, but I will not. <laughs> I what I do, Jeff, is I yeah, I'll go and say, hey, let's go get dinner. I want to take you out. That a boy, good for you. I assume. I said, psst, uh, psst, uh, girl, girl, you fine. Why don't you and me kick it later? That's what I say. That's what you say. You're like, want to come over? Maybe we can like you know like play some video games, check out my love. No, sack. I'm like I'm like a. An early 90s love connection. I'm like, well, uh, we were going to go out for some Italian food, maybe get some, catch a movie, and then I guess we'll see what happens, huh? And you said, girl, you took me for a flavor. If you can channel <laughs> Seth Green from the movie Can't Hardly Wait, that's the best way to approach women. I've never heard of that movie. Terrific film. Late 90s classic. Should be. Uh, there's not really. A, well, oh, Jeff oh, has. I've got a couple here. Deseret News, of course. You uh, tell me if you saw this. I got my ensign this month, and it came with a copy of Church News and Deseret News, quote unquote, National Edition, which was all of like a page. So this is a new marketing. You know, this is Sherry Dew calling in the big favor. She's like, listen, I know we've got a national audience. Let me market. But, she, but Sherry Dew doesn't run Deseret News. She runs Deseret Books. Sherry did. <laughs> Sherry did <laughs> anyway. That's what we'll name this episode. I, c- I can't sure. resist. I'm anyway, um, but yeah, it's wrapped in there. It's a new marketing tactic to try to hope that you'll sign up for uh, Boring. Deseret News. Don't sign up. I don't, don't sign up. I don't like it. It bothers me. Des- Ensign is a wonderful spiritual man- thing. I don't want the church to be basically telling me in a way that like I should be subscribing to a regular old news publication. Yeah, send me the church news, not the Deseret news. I, Maybe that's why it bugs me. I feel like the church is telling me that like this is a regular old newspaper. The one, This is the one I should be reading. You tell that church no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did you know that Salt Lake is the most godless city in America, according to Time magazine? I did not know this. Tell me more. We are the most godless city. It's because we don't read the Bible as much. Well, that doesn't apparently. make sense. Yeah, they they didn't have very good oh, criteria. But, but yeah, well, they pulled this out of like I think Bible Gateway, which is a very popular Bible website to read the Bible. But Mormons read the Bible through LDS.org if they're online. They just you know it's just what we do. Zing. So for some reason, Salt Lake is the least religious city in the country. Yeah, nobody uses Bible Gateway there. Oh, weird. And so therefore, we are there's just no religion, just none. It's over. Godless. All right, I'm cool with being done. Perfect. Jeff, it's been a delight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. As always, you can reach us, send us an email, contact at This Week in Mormons, no. or go leave a comment on thisweekinmormons.com, and you can follow along with a lot of Jeff's articles that he writes. He writes things about the word of wisdom and about uh, weird faux masturbation movies and things like that. So if you're interested in any of those things... Or in tattling on your roommate because he looks at pornography. Go go to the website. You're going to want to see this stuff Jeff is working on. Yeah, that's a great endorsement, though. Our side traffic is <laughs> going to shoot through the roof. Oh, thank you. I know. That was that was wonderful. And, of course, find us on Facebook, Twitter. Love seeing you there. Go to Vin- Instagram. Instagram now. We have, like, four things. We're late to the Instagram You're on Instagram, party. Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, the Twitters. You're everywhere, Subscribe Jeff. to this podcast if you're not subscribed. Subscribe to Sunday School Bonanza and get ready for Gospel Doctrine. And keep your eye out for Third Hour of Power, which we're doing with This Mormon Life, where we go through the teachings Third of the presidents hour of, of the power. church man. Wonderful things all around. We have an empire now, a veritable empire. All right, let's do it. I love looking hey, out at my subjects. Have a great week, Jeff. I Much will. Love, I look forward to telling you about this week, next week. When I will tell you about how I like ate food, and, and you did not a lot, but just hung out and, with some and, and watched The Bachelor, 
and did lots of productive things. I'm so excited for it. It's going to be terrific. I'm excited too, Jeff. I'll probably have been down to Phoenix on a whim and <laughs> taken the train to Grand Junction. Well, so until next well, time. Well, folks, wait. W- tune in next week to see, to find out, what did Jeff do with his week before? And we'll talk to you about it next week. I love it! I love That's it! That's going to happen, know. and it'll happen right here on This Week in Mormons. We'll talk to you later. See you, buddy. El amor se va Sobrevuela nuestras vidas sin piedad ¿Y qué más da? Si todo pasa deprisa y nada vuelve a comenzar Así que agárrate a mi espalda, vamos a volar Recorreremos la ciudad Como gotas de lluvia Tan solo quiero ir a bailar y entregarte mi vida y flotar ¿Qué tal estás? ¿Quieres tomar algo?